Douglas MacArthur was an interesting person. He was a military man from a young age, rising through the ranks of the US Army structure until becoming a general during World War II. During this war, MacArthur was one of the major commanders of the Allied war efforts in Asia, and thus being a major proponent in defeating the Japanese. At the end of the war, he took this picture with the Japanese Emperor, a purposeful propaganda picture, to show just how small the Japanese Emperor was. But his exploits during World War II are often overshadowed by his views on foreign policy. He was a firm anti-communist and anti-pacifist, considering war a valid response to the spread of communism. The Korean War in the 50s is the war that is perhaps most associated with MacArthur, even more than World War II. The Korean War would see the North Korean dictator Kim Il-sung invade South Korea, supported by the United States and various Western nations. Initially, it looked like North Korea may just manage to push the South out of the peninsula, but then the US-led coalition arrived. Soon, the North Koreans would be pushed back all the way to the Chinese border, and the very existence of North Korea as a state was now threatened. But not to fear, Chairman Mao is here. The leader of the recently turned communist China, Mao Zedong, decided that having a unified, capitalist Korea, with American military bases right on their border, would not be a good prospect. Apart from the loss of Korea being a massive spit in the face of international communism, it also removes the buffer state between China and the US-backed South Korea. It is also important to remember that at this point, America still practically had a monopoly on nuclear weapons, and nuclear weapons could not yet destroy the world or be launched from missiles. Mutually assured destruction would only come later in the Cold War, but by the time of the Korean War, the US had hundreds of nuclear weapons, while the Soviets had less than 20, and China itself had zero. So, considering the risks of allowing North Korea to fall, Mao Zedong intervened, counting on the fact that the US wouldn't want to escalate the war into a full-scale conflict with the most populous state on Earth, soon pushing the Korean War to a new stalemate. In our timeline, Mao was right. But that's where MacArthur comes in. Where our timeline's US leadership carefully considered their moves in the Korean War, MacArthur had different plans. MacArthur, anti-communist that he was, considered this to be the perfect time to expand the war and deal a decisive defeat to communism. Soviet expansion into Eastern Europe was terrifying in and of itself, but China held 20% of the world's population and had recently turned communist. If the war in Korea went well, America should, in MacArthur's opinion, continue to Beijing and restore the recently defeated Kuomintang to power in China. This led MacArthur to considering a radical course of action. While the Chinese were barreling down the Korean peninsula, MacArthur considered using nuclear weapons to stop the Chinese advance. During the early 50s, using nuclear weapons as a weapon of war was not yet as radical of a proposal as it would become later, but it was still generally considered a pretty extreme measure, likely to escalate the war into a full-scale war between the US and China. But MacArthur's reasoning was that by using tactical nuclear weapons, the Chinese supply routes to Korea would be devastated, trapping the Chinese without supply, and allowing the US-led coalition to destroy North Korea. From there, had it been up to MacArthur, the war would then be refocused upon China. And these were not just some random thoughts that MacArthur had, wrote down in his memoirs, but kept for himself. MacArthur was very vocal about these plans, and in 1951, President Truman, who did not share MacArthur's ideas, relieved MacArthur of command, and eventually de-escalated the war into a truce, arriving at the Korean borders we still know today. But what if this changed? We know with relative certainty that MacArthur wasn't bluffing about using nuclear weapons or invading China if he had the chance to. So what if, after winning the 1948 presidential election, it wasn't Truman calling the shots, it was MacArthur? Now here, I usually explain how this happens, but realistically, this wouldn't happen. Despite a split in the Democratic Party, with a southern faction called the Dixiecrats running their own candidate, Truman's Democrats still won with almost 50% of the votes, to 45% Republican. But for the sake of this scenario, we are just going to assume that, following the end of World War II, MacArthur relatively quickly ends his military career to go into politics while enjoying mass popularity for his war successes. He runs for the Republican Party, and thanks to the Dixiecrats split in the South, barely manages to win the election. General MacArthur would now be the 34th President of the United States. Now of course, we have the distinct possibility that the two years that MacArthur is in office, he somewhat mellows his perspective on international geopolitics. 
When you're a general, you have different considerations than when you are the president. But for the sake of this scenario, we are going to assume that MacArthur remains the same man, just waiting for the communist world to make a mistake so he can flex some American muscle. And in 1950, like discussed before, he would get his chance. Upon the invasion of Korea, MacArthur would jump up in his chair and prepare for a military response. While the UN would be busy discussing intervention, MacArthur already has a military response into Korea and potentially China prepared. Now, MacArthur is still bound somewhat by international geopolitics and internal politics. He cannot just say, North Korea invaded South Korea, we're nuking Moscow now. He needs justification. Stalin would look on in disappointment as MacArthur quickly and with great force responds to the Korean War. The entire Korean War, or at least the very significant Soviet diplomatic and military support for it, was built on Stalin's idea that Korea was not important enough for the US to defend and definitely not risk war over. How wrong he was. MacArthur's counterattack in Korea would be as successful as it was in our timeline. North Korea would be overrun very quickly and soon US forces would near the Chinese borders. Despite President MacArthur's explicit threats to China that if they intervene, he'd continue on to Beijing and that he wouldn't refrain from using nuclear weapons, both Mao and Stalin would assume that MacArthur was bluffing. Despite the Soviets not having a huge nuclear arsenal yet, they still have at least 20 nukes to use. Nothing to scoff at. Adding to this, the Soviets were definitely in a stronger, short-term position in both Europe and East Asia. The Soviets could rely on China to hold off the Americans in East Asia for a while, while the Soviets would try to blitz through Western Europe, potentially throwing a couple of tactical nukes themselves to ease the process. Nuclear weapons also had to be delivered via bomber at this stage of the Cold War, meaning that Stalin did not have to fear significant Western Russian cities getting hit. The only Soviet city under direct threat would be Vladivostok, while the Soviets could, with a bit of luck, strike major cities in Germany, Britain, France and Italy. All in all, even though the US has the nuclear and long-term edge in the war, starting a war with the communist bloc would be extremely costly, becoming even more devastating than World War II was, and there is no way that MacArthur would commit to it. Is what everyone would think. But then, Chinese forces cross the border, MacArthur would first attempt to hold them off conventionally, while also preparing for a counterattack which would remove the communists from power in China. But when the Chinese counterattack proved successful, MacArthur would resort to a more extreme measure. Barely five years after Japan's surrender, the US would once again use nuclear weapons. From here, we enter a very dark timeline from where I will present two options. The first is where Stalin and Mao decide that risking full-scale conventional and nuclear war isn't worth it over Korea and some form of peace deal is reached, and the second one where the Korean War escalates into World War III. The first scenario still sees MacArthur firing his nukes. Now it is debatable as to whether the US was even in a position to launch this massive nuclear strike. Like mentioned before, in the 50s you still needed bomber planes to deliver nuclear weapons. And China does have an active air force potentially capable of stopping the bombers from reaching their targets. But it's not too difficult to imagine that MacArthur, who is invested in invading China, has prepared enough to make sure that the Americans get air superiority and his nuclear attack goes through. Nuclear strikes hit key logistic targets in Korea and China and the world is suddenly in shock. Stalin and Mao immediately discuss what's next. Mao may push for Stalin to intervene, escalate the conflict to ensure that the US backs down, but Stalin is more collected. At the end of the day, a war with the West would be a massive risk. And if the US only takes North Korea, the communist world wouldn't take a huge loss here. Mao and Stalin decide to surrender North Korea if the US stops at the Chinese border. To appease Mao, Stalin extends some nuclear assurances, military support and a defensive pact, ensuring that China will not be the next to fall. So, Soviet and American diplomats discuss a peace deal and North Korea is absorbed into the South. MacArthur is a bit sad that he couldn't march into China, but he still announces a great victory for the Western world. But across the world, reactions are mixed. Using nukes in Korea has now set a precedent that the US may just use nuclear weapons in conventional war, meaning that other powers have a larger justification to do so as well. An alternate Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, Middle Eastern war, etc., could all be solved by nuclear weapons. And despite gaining Korea, the US has also been weakened on the world stage. The late 40s, early 50s 
was the only time in human history that there was something close to a nuclear monopoly. With the devastating power of nuclear fission in their control, the US could either push this advantage or prove themselves a responsible power. With this nuclear strike on Korea, the US has implicitly announced, do as we say or else. This will push the international neutral bloc more towards the Soviet side, as Stalin and the Soviets are now seen as cool-headed compromisers, not willing to risk millions over Korea, unlike the US. Apart from just the world leaders, people across the world, including in the US and Europe, would see these nuclear strikes as extreme and the popularity of communism, neutrality and pacifism would rise. Yes, Korea is now unified under the South, but was it really worth it? The Americans are diplomatically weaker as a global power. Nuclear weapons have been established as an okay way to wage conventional war, and in any future war between non-nuclear powers, nuclear weapons may be seen as an okay alternative. Once the communist world builds up their own nukes, they are even more assertive on the world stage. Constantly citing Korea as a reason to not give an inch to the Americans, while the neutral nations of the world gravitate more towards the Soviets. Even more so than in our timeline, even medium powers seek to get their own independent nuclear arsenal, as everyone fears that not having them could mean nuclear annihilation in any conflict. Now, it's very well possible that at some point the Cold War cools down again and eventually mutually assured destruction and a nuclear taboo sets in anyway as the Cold War grinds to a halt, much like in our timeline, but the memory and the threat of the Korean War will always be remembered as proof that one power shouldn't have a nuclear monopoly and the Korean War will always remain a major stain on the US international reputation. That's the first scenario, and it's a bit tame. While the Korean War was a shock to the world, eventually, as the Soviets and the Chinese build up their own nukes, good old mutually assured destruction would still set it. But what if we allow MacArthur to really follow his dreams? After striking the Korean border, he commits to a full-scale war with China. MacArthur declares that the Chinese actions are illegal, and soon Chinese cities and military facilities are attacked, and nukes are used to stop the Chinese push into Korea. Here, the calculation for Stalin is very difficult. War with the US is extremely risky. The US has more nukes and a safe position an ocean away from conflict. If Stalin now commits to defending China, he commits to a conventional war with the US, and there is a good chance that he would lose. But on the other hand, Stalin already considers war with the West inevitable. Yes, war with the West now is a risk, but does the Soviet situation improve by waiting? If Stalin doesn't intervene now, it's not just Korea that's lost, but also the 500 million Chinese building up a massive potential US ally on the Soviet southern border. From this position, it's not difficult to imagine the coming US encirclement of the Soviet Union. Allowing China to fall would practically be dooming the Soviet Union to losing the global power struggle to the Americans. And with the madman MacArthur in charge, who knows, he may just march into the Soviet Union anyways. So in Stalin's mind, there are two choices here allow China to fall and start building up for future conflict, but the problem is, the US will also be building up and now has the major edge in global power. Alternative option, join the Chinese fully, attack American positions in Asia, wait to see if the US backs down, and if they don't, full-scale war it is. While a full-scale war with the Western world would be extremely risky, it's less risky than allowing the US to take China and push communism back to just the Soviet Union and their Eastern European puppets. MacArthur, not to be deterred, starts World War III in the 1950s. How would this war go? Initially, it would go okay for the Soviets. Like mentioned before, no major Soviet cities are really under nuclear threat at the start of the war, and on the ground, the Soviets start off fine. The US is fighting a war in Asia and Europe, while the Soviets can barrel down Europe while China holds the line in Asia. But the long term is where the Soviets suffer. Nukes have been established as an acceptable conventional weapon. While the Soviets would also rapidly start producing more and more, the US most certainly holds the edge at the start of the war. After the Soviet invasion of Europe grinds down, likely around the Rhine River, the real war would begin. The War of Attrition. The most important aspect of this war would be the air war. As nukes can only be delivered via bomber, having air superiority is what allows nukes to fly. Don't think that the first months of the war would be marked by American or Soviet tactical nukes flying back and forth. Nukes are way too valuable for that. One first needs air supremacy, then nukes can fly. So the world goes back into war mode as both China and Europe, after a short five years of peace, 
once again become the center of a world war. But the long-term conflict massively favors the Americans. The Americans, especially with British help, are the undisputed masters of the sea, meaning that the US mainland is completely safe to go into war production mode and export war materials across the world. In contrast, the Soviets are cornered, desperate, and after their initial offensives fail, on the permanent defensive. It is a simple matter of time before the Americans manage to start to outproduce the Soviets and begin to push back the Soviet Union. But the cost of this would be astronomical. Much like in 1941, the Soviet Union is fighting a war of extermination. Soviet bombers flying suicide missions into Western Europe would see mass destruction despite Western victories in the air and on the front lines. The death count of this war would at least be in the tens of millions, but potentially hundreds of millions, outscaling World War II in terms of death count. The Americans and the West would inevitably win this war, eventually. But at what cost? The world is devastated. Little is left of Europe, China or the Soviet Union, as most of the world has been destroyed by war, nuclear exchanges, failing logistics, famines and the destruction of the climate. What was it all for? Europe now lies in ruin, not even having been able to recover from World War II before a new war, including nuclear weapons, happens on their continent. The border nations would be completely destroyed, but even nations like France, Italy and the Benelux are devastated, while the Eastern Bloc is once again the most contested frontline in the world. But what would be really incomprehensible would be the death toll in China. The death toll of this war in just China could be higher than in both world wars before it, if not because of direct nuclear strike, then because of the failings of agriculture in the state thanks to the nuclear attacks and the devastation of logistics. Not to even mention the very distinct possibility of nuclear winter descending upon Earth, devastating the climate and causing even more havoc even in nations not directly targeted by the war. The only nation, mostly unaffected by bombs or soldiers, is the US, which now gets to be the hegemon over a destroyed world. What a great victory it was. But with this, I will end this scenario. I hope you enjoyed it and I thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed the content, consider subscribing and leaving a like and a comment to help me against the algorithm. A special thanks to these patrons who help me dedicate more time and effort to the channel. Consider supporting me there to get around two weeks of early access to videos. Again, thank you all for watching and goodbye.